you know, I feel like almost like I'm doing this mostly for him. So I'll finish what he started when he, he can't. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 8 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, your host and the president over here at Whistlekick. If you're new to this show, I'd like to ask you to check out what we do at Whistlekick.com, and you can learn more about this show at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. On today's show, we have Eddie Andujar, a karate practitioner from Massachusetts. I've gotten to know Mr. Andujar a bit from the martial arts events I visit through Whistlekick and really liked his story. Honestly, it's not always a happy one, even compared to some of our past guests. But it's a good story, and there's a lot to take away from it. The martial arts has played a tremendous role in Eddie's life, and I think you'll agree that he's taken a lot from it himself. Eddie Andujar, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. All right, thanks for having me, there. It's an honor. Absolutely. Oh, it's an honor to have you. So let's let's jump into this, man. All right. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about your history with the martial arts. How'd you get started, and oh. why'd you get started? Long, that. Uh, yeah, I started off young. Um, my father, he got me into boxing. That was his thing. Uh, did that from six to 11 years old, the boys club, long time. Um, then I uh, switched over to Taekwondo. That was my first uh, martial arts school that I went to. I started, we started, we moved over to a new neighborhood and that was in the neighborhood. So my parents got me into that and I got involved with that for about uh, two years, and uh, things were going tough for my family, so we um, they couldn't really afford it, as uh, so that left my options limited. Um, so I had to stop doing that for a while. Uh, yeah, and after Taekwondo, I um, got involved in Kuksu Wan when I was 25. So I took a long break in between. Um, I started going to the YMCA and they had the classes available there. They were free as long as you were a member at the YMCA. So I got involved with that for about two years and got my nephew involved in all that. And uh, uh, then my nephew ended up getting hit by a drunk driver on his bike. So we, uh, mm. it was hard for me to go back to that school. You know, just I kept bringing back bad memories or good memories, yeah. you know, but it was still hard for me to train after that for a while. After uh, the whole Cooks of One, I, uh, I took a break for a little while. I met a woman, got married, settled down. Um, she had kids of her own, so um, uh, her youngest started taking the Shotokan Karate at um, Mass Martial Arts Academy. Me being his father, you know, bringing them to classes and stuff, getting to know the people over there. They were really great people, you know. Just They grew on me. We started doing stuff together other than karate, like rock climbing and stuff like that, and it just... That made me want to join again, you know. After my yeah, after after taking that time off, sure. Yeah, after I mean that's a deal with my loss of my nephew. So so you've got you know a couple periods in here where where you went into martial arts and you you stepped away and you went back in and you and you stepped away, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm really curious about that first one where you when you were doing taekwondo as a teenager, and then you said you you were out of the martial arts until your mid twenties. Right. Did I get that timeline right? Yeah. So one of the things that's often an issue for parents or instructors in the martial arts is that a, a teenage child wants to step away. They want to go do other sports or right. they want to go do something. I mean, the reasons aren't always the same, but there was something about it that even though you, you stepped away for a while, you came back, you were, gl- you were, I mean, I'm assuming happy to come back. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Cause I think there's something good in there. Well, coming back, you know, I needed that security. I mean, every child needs that security and you know, having stability, you know, uh, and, like stability is a big thing that I didn't have when I was growing up. Um, so to have like that camaraderie and friends that you need and something that everybody needs, you know, and being deprived sure. of that, you know, for not having stability, that was one of the key things for me coming back. And- yeah, one one of the pieces of advice because I've often had parents come to me and say, you know, you know, I, I've been fortunate in that most of the schools I've been in, I've not been the instructor, so there are certain issues that parents are often more comfortable bringing to me, and one of them is about the teenager that wants to kind of go do their own thing. So right. um, it's it's interesting to hear that you know you're kind of validating what I often tell people, which is. Hey, if they want to go do something else for a while, let them. Because if you force them to stay in the martial arts, yeah. they're not going to leave with as positive a memory. Right. 
and they're going to be less likely to come back to it when they're ready, like you were able to. Right, right. So you've bounced around. You've been to some different schools. You got any good stories you could share? The biggest thing about going through all those different schools, is, you know, personally, for me, is the people that I've met through going to those schools. It makes a big impact on my life. Like, you call these people friends and then all of a sudden they become your family like my karate family you know and i'm sure other people can relate to that like their taekwondo family or their kung fu family sure. um one of the biggest things for me this is the connections that you make through all these people everybody's so friendly and they genuinely care about you you can tell you know yeah, yeah absolutely i think it's something that is it's not uncommon in fact i'd say it's it's the rule that you know there may be some exceptions but for the most part, people that train develop that. It's yeah, it's like a family, right? For sure. Being that you started with martial arts so young, being that it's threaded in and out of your life, I'm sure it's had an impact on you, on who you are, who Eddie is as a person. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How you've, how you think your life has benefited from that time in the martial arts? It, I've uh, I was really short tempered when I was younger. Um, I was always getting in fights in school and I, that had a big thing to do with my stability and my insecureness. So, you know, martial arts, that really helped me with my confidence and giving me an outlet for my anger, training and being able to spar and burn that energy off that I was just using destructively. It, uh, it helps me a lot mentally as well as physically. Do you find you have the same benefits from it now training as an adult? I do, even more so. Because, you know, life's pressures get on you and, you know, the only way to burn those off too is, for me, is through martial arts. Um, just being able to, even like, even when not going to dojo, like I'm home after a stressful day and whether it be like, you know, stretching or training at home or meditating or whatever the case may be, I try to keep, uh, I try to keep a level head now that I'm older. Think about a low point in your life and how your martial arts experience helped you through that? Uh, about a year ago, I was still in, I was still in this school, Shotokan school. Um, I was going through a separation and it ended up turning into a divorce. So um, that was hard for me. And martial arts helped me get through that. It gave me something to focus on, train and, and getting back into it and like fully dedicating myself to it. Because before it was just going because my son was going and that whole routine, but it changed once I got divorced and it gave me uh, an outlet to distract me from that. It took me away from all that low point that I was going through in my life. Sure. Did you find that you had uh, support from your martial arts family? I did. I did. Cause we was all close and we all knew each other and um, they would always check on me to see how I'm doing. And I mean, I'm seeing them two or three times a week and they're just making sure that I'm okay. And if I need anything, that means a lot, you know, cause especially when I don't have that many people to look out for me, they do. Yeah. I can, I can only imagine how hard a time that was for you, but how much harder it would have been without that support. Right. Right. I don't know what I would have done, <laughs> honestly. Uh, there, there are a lot of people that don't go through the, that experience very well because they don't have support, because they're not talking to somebody or, right. you know, they're bottling it all up. And so here you've developed some tools to express yourself physically. Right. So you're not bottling it up. But then you've also got people you can talk to that you're comfortable with. Right, right. And There's something to be said for sweating, for sort of suffering with people you know, sense, week after week. Right. And my sensei could see that too. He would push me a little bit harder to like get, he, if he seen me like days and off a little bit, he would push me harder. So that way I, you know, wouldn't be distracted in class or, mm. you know, he, he would notice if I was not there, you know? So I'd like you to name somebody other than your instructors. And I guess we'd have to count each of them that has been a significant impact on your martial arts training? My biggest impact is my nephew. Um, being able to overcome his death and I'll go back to training is a really big deal for me. And I feel like he's right there beside me, you know, pushing me and 
you know, I feel like almost like I'm doing this mostly for him. So I'll finish where he started when he, he can't. Or, mm. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't want to gloss over that. I, you know, I right. want to make sure I'm, I'm honoring that that answer. That's right. That's that's a big deal. Now, does I'm assuming that's that's the the name and the date on your arm. It is. Uh, no, uh, well, I have no. him up there too. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I got him on the other side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm always reminded by him. I, I have a necklace engraved with his name. You know, I I'm always at his. I'm always at his uh, burial site. I'm always, I'm always at his grave. I'm always, um, I got his name tattooed on me. I mean, he, he, I think about him a lot, and especially when I'm training, and I just, I always, you know, think about him. Or, you know, even before like a tournament, you know, I would just, you know, think about him or pray to him. You know, so that he motivates me. If you could train with any martial artist. Living or dead, who would that be and why? I could train with anybody. My my pick would definitely have to be Chuck Norris. You know, he's just he's how old is he now? Seventy something years old, almost eighty years old, and he's been. I think he just still, turned seventy five. Seventy five years old, and look at the guy. He's still amazing shape. He looks like he's, he doesn't even look like he's a day over fifty. You know? No. Uh, he. Uh, I mean, you don't get tougher than that either. I mean, you you see it all out there. Nobody's tougher than. Chuck Norris, and he's just, you know, he's trained with the best. I'm sure he has a plethora of knowledge from martial arts that I could learn a yeah. lot from. I'm sure at 75, he could still take out both of us at the same time. <laughs> could you no imagine? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a story I wouldn't even mind telling people. I got beat up by a 75-year-old man. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Chuck Norris. <laughs> oh, okay. I understand now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, yeah, it would definitely have to be Chuck Norris. He's uh he's in everything. He's just a movie. He's an actor, martial artist. You know, there's so many out there that uh, this uh, that was a tough question for me. There's so many out there that I would love to train with. Uh, sure. Tony Job, ja, Bruce Lee. Uh, Donnie Yen, so many of them. Dolph Lundgren, Wesley Snipes. There's so many martial artists that, some karate martial artists on top of that too. Yeah, a big thing for me. Absolutely. Would is Chuck Norris your favorite martial arts actor? He is by far. Yeah. Um, would I, or, no, he's he's not right now. Um, he's not. Yeah. Ever since Tony Shaw came on the scene, and I just started following him. There's just his style and. All the different martial arts that he brings together, just kind of like um, Bruce Lee did. It's it blows my mind to see him do his work. He's an artist for sure. He is pretty incredible, absolutely. <laughs> any any movies? Oh yeah, the Ong Bak. Just come to mind. The whole Ong Bak trilogy. I just finished watching yeah. the last episode, the last one, and when he's uh. I don't know if you've seen it, but when he's doing the training in the temple and he's getting his mind right. Yep. He's like battling his demons and that's like a big thing for me. Like I like, that's like one of the biggest things for me in a movie that I appreciate and just his fighting alone. It's like, he's fighting as if Buddha was fighting himself, you know, it's just, yeah, I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> so what is it called? Moy Baran, I think it is when he's doing the, uh, it's like Tibetan foot stomp, the, the whole, uh, I can't even explain it. I've tried looking it up. <laughs> well, you know, people are just going to have to watch the movies if they uh, haven't seen them. Exactly. If you haven't heard of Tony Ja and Unbach, then you haven't lived yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the of course, in the show notes, I'll have links to the Unbach movies cool. for people to check out. That's awesome. Do you have any martial arts related goals for the future? I do. I do. Um, I, I've been doing a lot of tournaments lately, and I've been looking to. Um, maybe do a little bit of full contact. Um, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to travel and, you know, not if traveling was free, I'd be gone already. Let's face it. But, <laughs> um, I would love to travel and train with different people in different countries, you know, go live out in China for three months, go train out in China or Japan. Or, I mean, that's a dream that I would love to come true, but 
in reality, I'm probably just going to stay here and get my black belt and keep doing the iPhone league and see how far that takes me. I don't think you need to throw the word just in there. I, I think oh, okay. You should have added that out. Well, <laughs> no, I'm going to leave that in. I want people to hear that, but I, I think that there's a, there's a modesty there that you're, that you're throwing onto it. And anybody that has trained long and hard enough to earn their black belt to, to make martial arts a lifelong pursuit. It's, we all know as black belts that uh, it's not something that you just kind of gloss over. It's not something that deserves the word just. Right. Right. I understand. It's, yeah. Don't, don't be, uh, don't be little that at all. That's a huge goal. And I think it's an important one. Right. Right. Um, I got a feeling I'm going to be with these guys for a long time. So, um, it's not the rest of my life. You know, I, I, I got to do it on my own now and, I don't have to worry about my parents not being able to afford it anymore or yep. the case may be. So I don't Good. have any excuses. Nope. Just opportunities. Right. Exactly. Do you have any parting advice for the martial artists listening to this show? I would say to just keep that fire going, keep that passion going. You know, everybody's got that spirit and I see that some people have it more than others and some people learn to have it later or some people have it sooner than others. And I just, I don't know when the tough gets going, you go and get tough, just stick it through. And <laughs> Okay, great. That, that went really well. I want to thank you for being on the show, Eddie. Appreciate yeah, your time. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It's a great, op- it's a great opportunity and I look forward to being on the show again when I'm a black belt. I love that. That's, <laughs> that is a perfect ending right there. Man. <laughs> I dig it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. A big thank you to Eddie Andujar for coming on and telling us his story. Please be sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss one of our weekly episodes. If you do like the show, we'd really appreciate a five-star review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can check out the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great addition, please help us and fill out the guest form. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about the stuff we do at Whistlekick, please check us out on the web at whistlekick.com, or we're all over social media with the handle Whistlekick. Thanks a lot, train hard, smile, and have a great day.